Before social media took over our lives, long before we were talking about media censorship, before the era of ridiculous internet fame, before our lives were dictated by our addiction to scrolling endlessly on our screens, there was this. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. This is where it all started. All the boons and issues of the modern world can be traced back to this iconic day. It's hard to understate the impact of this day. Like honestly, this was truly a day that changed the world. And there's very few landmark days that surpass this. And perhaps nobody in the audience knew that their lives were about to change forever, but they were. This little device is the backbone of all of our daily lives, and now, I can't even imagine a life before smartphones existed. But 15 years ago, no one could have imagined what life was going to be like. Cause let's rewind to 16 years ago. This is what your phone looked like. Yeah, crazy to think that this wasn't the obvious choice, but it wasn't. Cause this phone is causing no revolutions, that's for sure. The screen is too tiny for any kind of content consumption. The keyboard is just a mess. The navigation is inconvenient to say the least. Compare that to the iPhone and it's hard to deny that it set the blueprint that even modern phones use to this day. I mean, look at this shit. Not much has changed over the last 15 years. The interface is still dominated by the screen and we're just making it even more dominating today. The multi-touch is just as smooth. You have your power volume controls and then the silent switch. The UI is shockingly modern. You have your lock screen, then your home screen with all your apps, and even that little dock with all your main apps is the same. The design is surprisingly timeless with solid build quality. Look at how well built this phone is. There's no gaps in the edges, no mistakes in the construction, just undeniably Apple. The back is solid aluminum, with the little plastic bottom for the antenna. The front was supposed to be plastic, and it was during the keynote, but Jobs wanted that switch to glass by the launch, and so what we now know is Gorilla Glass came in. The front has an ambient light sensor so the display shuts off when you bring it to your ear. There's no front camera, that wouldn't come until the iPhone 4, only a 2 megapixel rear camera that did only photos. But I would say that didn't really matter to people back in 2007, because look at this reaction. We got a 2 megapixel camera built right in. I'd say this is pretty standard 2007 camera quality, but sheesh, look at this screen. With the resolution of 320 by 480, it is definitely dated, because you can see the individual pixels. It's easy to sit here and think, wow, how could people not see that this was the clear future? But change is hard. Usually things that break the norm to such an extent don't always work out, and boy did people voice that. Reaction when you saw that. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Probably one of the low points of Steve Ballmer's career, since Microsoft did not see the threat for the longest time, and by the time they did, it was just too late, with Windows Phone really being dead on arrival. And it wasn't just him. BlackBerry CEO Mike Lazaridis is also a similar story, with them scoffing at the iPhone. So did Nokia. All the top docs thought they were untouchable, but they weren't, because all of them are gone now. Except Microsoft, but they're gone from the phone market. You know who was shit scared? A little group working on a phone project at Google called Android, who after watching the iPhone unveiling, went back to the drawing board because they saw this as the clear future, and they're the only ones standing today. It does have a touch screen, pretty unique on a cell phone, and there are absolutely no buttons except one right down here that takes you back to the home menu. Maybe this isn't obvious today, but developing the first iPhone was quite the nightmare, because literally everything was new. None of this hadn't been done before, like the scrolling. So simple, right? Wrong! Not only did the software have to be written to communicate with the hardware, the touchscreen to do so had to be pioneered. Which actually started back in the 1980s, with the University of Toronto inventing it in 1982, and the first working multi-touch display being built in 1984. However, some of you might have heard about Fingerworks pioneering it, and that is true for the commercial market, but that was in the late 90s. What they created was a gesture-based pad that detected finger movements, and the idea was to merge that with the screen to create a multi-touch display. See, the way touch screens worked back in the day was there were two layers of conductive sheets separated by a thin gap, and when you pressed on it, the two layers would touch, registering a click. Which, if you've ever used those frustrating ATM machines, or those airline checking kiosks where you have to put all your weight into it, or a Nintendo DS, that's still using that age-old technology. This was clearly not the way to go, and the way this new technology worked was quite different. Your fingers are slightly electrically conductive, and the way the capacitive touchscreen worked was it detected changes in the capacitance, thus registering the touches. This was a crucial point on which everything depended on, since I'd say it was the touchscreen that changed everything. Apple had this technology on hand for a while, and they are figuring out what to do with it. The first obvious answer was to use it on a laptop. Then there was this very interesting looking iPad prototype from 2004, which looks a lot more like the iPad Pro than the original iPad. They also had a large table set up with a projector on top and it being touch sensitive. However, during this time, the iPod was ridiculously successful, but Apple was fairly concerned that phones would eventually take over the iPod's market. 
It hadn't happened yet, with phones having very little storage, but it would happen eventually. Who knows who had the idea first, but out of fear of losing market share, the iPhone started. Apple did try and work with existing phone makers like creating the Motorola Rocker, but Steve Jobs could barely hide his contempt for it during the presentation. But when the iPhone project did eventually start, there were actually two distinct groups working on two separate phone projects. One was the iPod phone, very much like the one Jobs actually mocked in the iPhone presentation, and then the multi-touch smartphone. The iPod phone was an interesting concept to say the least, with the iPod scroll wheel acting like an old school rotor phone. Scrolling and other iPod features worked great, but when it came to smartphone features like dialing and typing, it was just a mess, with it eventually being shut down to focus all resources on the multi-touch smartphone. However, now that multi-touch was to be a focus, the issue became that since this was never done before, no one knew how to manufacture it. Somehow, Apple found a company in Taiwan called TPK and promised to buy every screen they produced, but that was the least of their problems. The iPhone didn't have a CPU until very late in the development, and even when Samsung came in with an underclock version of their ARM 1176JZ, it was heavily unreliable, with systems crashing constantly, apps being corrupted if you open something in the wrong order, and it could have crashed from anything from a simple software bug to a hardware-level catastrophe. In fact, you'll notice that Steve Jobs had three iPhones present during the keynote presentation to pick up if the main one crashed, and the presentation was meticulously rehearsed, with the order of demonstrations fixed in order to avoid any unseen crashes. Things were a mess leading up to the launch. The design team had originally envisioned an anodized aluminum design akin to the iPod mini, but it had terrible signal problems. So after going back to the drawing board, they came up with this final design. And for all of Apple's bragging about how they create both the hardware and software to integrate seamlessly, both divisions were actually kept in the dark about each other. In late 2006, Jobs called a meeting that clearly showed that the iPhone had a myriad of problems ranging from battery charging to apps being corrupted. Johnny Ive, this guy, even stated that the iPhone was almost entirely shelved because they thought they had problems that were simply unsolvable. There were regular shouting matches in the office. One employee slammed a door so hard she was locked in because she bent the steel handle. People pulled all-nighters coding, working countless hours and weekends to get it done. Some people even credit the iPhone development as a reason for their divorces. But after all that work, things finally started to come together in December of 2006. And the rest is history. Or that's what you would think. This is how you turn it on. This is your music. That really wasn't the end of the problems, because nothing that's first is ever perfect. Like I mentioned before, the iPhone during the keynote had a plastic screen, and the change to glass was made after the presentation, in those six months between January 2007 and June 2007. Reportedly, Steve Jobs hated the fact that his key scratched his iPhone when it was in his pocket. So in typical Steve Jobs fashion, he went, I want a glass screen, and I want it perfect in six weeks. Reports are conflicting as to if this was actually done in six weeks or six months, but it led Apple to corny gank. They had developed a ridiculously strong glass back in the 1960s with a chemical process that could withstand pressures of up to 100,000 pounds per square inch. They had seen some commercial applications in cars and planes, but it never really went anywhere, so they discontinued it way back in 1971. So when Apple came knocking, Corning said, Hey man, we don't really have a way to manufacture at scale what you want. To which Shop said, You can do it. And that's how Gorilla Glass was created. Foxconn won the bid for manufacturing the iPhone, and set up a new factory just for it. In all that time, Apple did the much needed work of ironing out the bugs that plagued the presentation prototype. And still it wasn't perfect. For starters, Apple had made an exclusive deal with Singular, which shortly after the keynote presentation changed its name to AT&T, and didn't have the best reputation at the time. Not only that, but the iPhone launched for $4.99 fully subsidized with a two-year contract. And they were exclusively available on AT&T, nowhere else. I know Steve Ballmer sounds like an idiot, but he does have a point. It is a ridiculously expensive phone in 2007. For all its pioneering features, the iPhone actually lacked a lot of basic functionality, because speaking of cell service, apparently the iPhone 2G had a terrible problem with dropping calls. It did not have MMS features and didn't even have copy and paste. The App Store was not present and would not be until a full year later in 2008. Apparently, Steve Jobs didn't like the idea of an App Store and was more inclined to web-based apps that would run through Safari. Obviously, he was wrong about that, and the App Store is one of those features that propelled the iPhone into the stratosphere. And going to the hardware, the original iPhone did have a headphone jack, but it's this weird dimension so that some headphones wouldn't fit. The camera is also present, but it doesn't do video, which believe it or not, phones at the time did. It also didn't have GPS, so you couldn't really use it instead of your sat navs. And most importantly, there's a reason why the next iPhone was called the iPhone 3G, because this one didn't have 3G. That was actually quite a bummer, because all of this technology packed in and the iPhone was still behind the competitors in some major regards. Did all this matter? No, not really. The things they got wrong were much more insignificant than what they got right, and boy did they nail some of these things. But the iPhone wasn't an immediate runaway success. It did well, but it didn't overtake the market with a pretty good 6 million sold. 
Truth be told, with all these crutches, the iPhone was never gonna immediately overtake BlackBerry and Nokia. It takes time to iron out quirks, to make it cheaper, to make it more functional, and to make it more accessible from different carriers. This was a false comfort in Nokia and BlackBerry, who had their best selling times years after the iPhone was released. But suddenly, as the iPhone drastically improved with each iterative ear, sales fell off a cliff for the two former giants. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and you're your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun. It is undeniable that the arrival of the iPhone changed everything. To start off with, the phone market in the early 2000s was pretty much dominated by Nokia. In fact, to this day, out of the top 10 best-selling phones of all time, 9 of them are made by Nokia. But if you went back 18 years and told everyone that in 20 years, Nokia is going to be basically non-existent, nobody would have believed you. They had troubles, man, which can directly be traced back to this. And while 2008 was their best ever year, things took a pretty downward spiral after that. They were bought by Microsoft for $7.2 billion to be used for Windows Mobile, but that didn't really work out, so they were sold for $350 million. And today, Nokia doesn't really have any significant market share. In fact, they don't even make their own phones. They license the name to a different company called HMD Global, which is made up of former Nokia executives. The one mistake of not focusing on catching up with Apple cost them everything. Same goes for BlackBerry. In fact, BlackBerry CEO Mike Lazaridis was quoted as saying, talking about the iPhone, this is an impossibility. The networks won't be able to carry this. It's illogical that anyone would even propose this. In all fairness, he did have a point. The original iPhone did have notorious network issues, but what he didn't predict was that technology would rapidly catch up, so BlackBerry would continue to see explosive success until 2011, which was their best ever year. But then, things took a pretty big nosedive. They were years behind on their own OS called Symbian OS, so in 2013, they made the decision to switch to Android and make the now traditional multi-touch phones. However, you need to have years of extensive research and expertise to create competitive phones, and since BlackBerry was way behind the curve, they never really had a hit. In 2016, BlackBerry started licensing the hardware to third parties and focusing on software, until 2022, where it was announced that support for all BlackBerry phones will be discontinued. What does BlackBerry do now? They mostly focus on cybersecurity stuff. And even though they're still around, they're not what they used to be. And you could be the most diehard Android fan, but you cannot deny that without the iPhone, Android would not exist in its current state. Google was quick to capitalize on the iPhone revolution, not only making Android akin to iOS, but also working with Apple to bring Google Maps, Gmail, and even YouTube, which was built into iOS for the longest time. And this isn't even counting the countless revolutions from other companies. Think about it. How much of social media do you really use on your computer anymore? Apart from YouTube, most of these social media apps aren't even optimized to run on a desktop environment. Are you really checking your Instagram stories on your laptop or scrolling through TikTok on your desktop? How much of the social media revolution started here? There's literally an app for anything, you name it. You have access to the internet 24 seven. Tell people in 2005 that in two years, they would have a portable computer in their pockets and their jaws would have dropped. Have a question? Ask Siri. Wanna record your kid's birthday? Who uses camcorders anymore? Just use your iPhone. Wanna start an Instagram photography page? Just take pictures with your iPhones. No more iPods for music, no more sat -nas for GPS, no more digital cameras for photos. It all happens with one device. The iPhone was made out of fear that smartphones will kill the existing iPod industry. So they didn't just kill the existing smartphone industry. They killed all of these product markets with just one device. Honestly, these days my wallet's been replaced with my iPhone, cause you don't really use cash anymore, and apart from ID, all of your cards are stored on Apple Pay. Most people would get anxious just leaving their house without their phones. What if I get lost, I'll need maps. What if I need to call an Uber? What if I get bored while I'm lost, I need TikTok. The early 2000s person would be shocked and embarrassed that we've become so dependent on these devices. I'm 22, so for most of my life the iPhone has existed, but I do have faint memories of a time when my parents would drive to the nearest AAA to get maps before driving to an unknown place, or borrow a laptop at someone's house to quickly check their emails. For all the modern crap Apple might have pulled, for all the stories of Steve Jobs being an insufferable asshole, for all the loss of excitement over the slow iterative upgrades of the new iPhones, one thing is for sure, we owe it all to Jobs and his team, who through thick and thin, through cancer diagnoses and divorces, through frustrations and long sleepless nights, accomplished something that truly changed the world as we know it.